Archaeologists have been studying the ancient Maya civilization for over 150 years. You'd think that there's really not much new to uncover in the Maya lowlands, and yet the project acquired 400 square kilometers of LiDAR data for the eastern Puk region, and amongst this array of hills were a couple of small sites that had not been documented by archaeologists one of which was the site that turned out to be Shanab Chak. One of the aims of our project is to understand these really small-scale early sites and compare them with some of the larger Acropolis sites to the north and see how they interacted with each other and what that said about the early development of civilization in this part of the Maya lowlands that is particularly challenging to live in. This area is distinctive. It's raised above the water table. There are no cenotes or sinkholes like people would have had access to farther to the north in the northern plains area. It's elevated, it's a slightly older geologic formation and people could not access groundwater through ancient well digging technology because it's more than 150 feet below the surface in this case. So in the Puk region, people relied completely on rainfall for all of their water needs. And so they really had to develop a lot of methods for capturing and storing water. And this would have delayed the settlement of the Puk region by agriculturalists because it would have required the development of these systems before people could live there year round. The pre-classic period is when we first see the growth of complexity in the Maya lowlands. Early agriculturalists move into around 3000 to 4000 BC and they start to clear the forests and set up small farming villages. We start to see the climate become more stable and so populations grow. Shanab Chak was one of these earliest settlements in the Puk region and so we're working to understand this transition from hunters and gatherers to these actual permanent settlements where people would have been living year-round and farming and would have required the development of these intricate water capture and storage techniques. Shanab Chak has a central platform mound that's 37 by 34 meters across and it has a secondary structure on top of it. It borders on a central plaza area that's bordered to the west by a very low residential platform and to the north by a ball court area. The central platform was built in at least two phases. So early on, they would have built up this relatively raised area on a low outcrop and then expanded it in generations later. In our first full field season of excavation, we made a very curious discovery. We found a small ceramic figurine buried in the center of the central platform. It's a small sitting figurine, about uh, five inches high. A person sitting cross-legged holding a really large tecomate or bowl in their hands. And they're wearing a turban and they're staring out with slightly parted lips. This would have been an exciting find no matter what, but what made it especially curious and peculiar and extra exciting for us was the fact that it appears to be the first figurine dating to the middle pre-classic period that has yet been found in the northern lowlands as a whole, not just in the Puk region. So immediately we start to think, where did this come from? Was this made locally by the people living at Chanab Chak? Or was it maybe made in Guatemala or Belize, places where we know that they were making ceramic figurines like this during that time period, about 500, 600 BC, and then was either brought up to the site by someone from the area that had traveled down there, 
or was it traded up to the site from there by intermediaries along the way? Either way, this figurine being buried at Chanap Chak tells us that this small site, which today seems to be in the middle of nowhere in the back woods of the Puk region, was actually plugged into a widespread trading network that connected small sites up in the north with sites farther to the south. We've now completed two seasons of excavations at Chanap Chak after a full mapping season. And we're finding a lot of ceramics. When they built the ball court, they used a lot of broken pottery to fill in the gaps between the stones. That pottery tells us what time period these structures were built, dating roughly from 900 to 300 BC. We learned that the ball court was actually built up over four successive periods from a very small central playing alley that was maybe a mix of clay and a little bit of crushed limestone to larger and more elaborate constructions until the final version was a pretty wide and long playing alley made of a plastered surface and then these two parallel structures with big terraces on the sides. So this would have been probably an area that was not just used for playing the Mesoamerican ball game, but also possibly for public gatherings, for pronouncements, for other types of ceremonies as well. And the fact that we have at least four levels of construction helps us show how the site grew over time. The first iteration of the ball court may have dated back to really the earliest time that people were living at the site, maybe around 800 to 900 BC. And then over many generations, they built up the ball court over time. We can't say for sure right now, but when you have these large construction projects that are built for a civic purpose for the public, it generally tends to correlate with increasing centralization of power. And this also correlates with the larger construction or the building up of the central platform of the site as well. So we see this happening around the Maya area and around the world. As populations get bigger, as people are living in one place for longer, you tend to trend from a more egalitarian baseline to a more stratified civilization with a more centralized power structure. It's hard to develop population estimates for these ancient times, especially the pre-classic period, but we're probably dealing with a village that at its peak was maybe 200 to 500 people living at this site. We see an abandonment around 300 BC. Around that time, there's a general depopulation in the Puk region, and the main reason for that would likely have been a downturn in the climate. This is an area where you need rainfall year after year to be able to survive, and so if there's a decrease in rainfall for any number of years, two years even, people are gonna have to leave the region. And we don't see people returning in any large numbers for several centuries after that. In these coming years, we're gonna be looking at these smaller house mounds that surrounded the site center to really look at what people had access to in their day-to-day -day lives, in their households, the types of materials they were working with, and what their structures looked like, how they were built. Before this, for hundreds of thousands of years, our ancestors were living as hunter-gatherers. Being able to study a site like Shanab Chak, where we actually see agricultural settling in this landscape that had not seen agricultural practice before, it has the potential to yield these really interesting insights about the transition to complexity Of course, we're not discovering anything as archaeologists. Discovering implies that this is the first time that people are seeing these things. But of course, we're uncovering things that people made, areas where people lived and worked in their own lives. So we're not discovering anything, but we are uncovering bits of people's existence that have really not been looked at or interacted with for thousands of years in this case. So that's inherently thrilling unto itself.